So um, I will talk about what we can learn about our solar cells by looking at photoluminescence. And um, okay, can I? Yes, I can. And maybe I need a laser pointer. Okay, this is better. So in the end, we want to make a solar cell. In the end, we want to make a good solar cell. And um, we measure that by measuring IV. And so why do we need photoluminescence? Well, one thing is um, so all, all solar cells and perovskite solar cells are no, uh, are no exceptions, are complex structures. You have the absorber, you have various interface, uh, various contact layers, various interfaces. And um, if your solar cell works good, you know that everything is fine. But if your solar cell doesn't work, you don't know if the problem is with the absorber or if the problem is with your contact. And that's one point where, where, where photoluminescence can help you. Um, so photoluminescence gives you essentially the absorber properties. And we will see you, when you change the contacts, you also can see the interface properties. What we measure with photoluminescence is quasi fermi level splitting, um, which we just learned um, we should not label as a voltage. But the first part of my talk is all at open circuit. So then the, the um, quasi fermi level splitting is exactly um, is um, the voltage. And um, then, therefore, I like to call the quasi fermi level splitting the internal voltage of the absorber, the voltage that the absorber is capable of. And then when you put your contact layers, you can screw everything up. But this is, you can't get better than, than this. And um, another thing we can determine by photoluminescence is the optical diode factor. And I explain what this is. And this is a direct directly related to the to the diode ideality factor, which has important consequences for the fill factor of the solar cell. So directly um, on the efficiency of the solar cell. And um, so quasi Fermi level splitting um, and how is it related with photoluminescence? Um, I think probably Thomas discussed a bit about this um, yesterday and what I've written here is the emission of any body in equilibrium. Any body in, in equilibrium emits black body radiation. And um, the, the energies we look at in photoluminescence for solar cell absorbers are always at energies a lot higher than KT. So we can write um, the black body radiation Planck's formula in the Boltzmann approximation. And um, this is anybody, be it a semiconductor, be it a metal, be it a piece of wood, um, essentially emits this black body radiation at equilibrium. Now, we all know that our absorbers and most bodies are not black bodies. And then we need to modify this black body spectrum with the absorptivity spectrum. This is not the absorption coefficient. This is the absorptivity spectrum. So the absorptance spectrum of the, of the material of the film itself. So this is, and this is the, the, the spectrum that um, our absorber emits in equilibrium. And this is of course related to the Einstein coefficient which is also sometimes called the radiative recombination coefficient. And this is due to the, it's every emission in a semiconductor is, is done by emitting photons by recombination of electrons and holes. So this is proportional to the product of electrons and holes in equilibrium, which is the square of the intrinsic carrier uh, concentration. And if we now, excite our absorber and get lumin photoluminescence, um, we still have the same radiative recombina recombination coefficient. 
But now we have a higher concentration of electrons or holes or electrons and holes. And we can express this higher concentration by the quasi Fermi level splitting. This is um, sort of the definition of the quasi Fermi level splitting is that it gives you the, 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 the product of the concentrations of electrons and holes in terms of the equilibrium concentration and it's higher by the exponential that contains the quasi Fermi level splitting. Now this first part was exactly our equilibrium emission. So what we get in non-equilibrium is the same spectrum as in equilibrium multiplied by the, uh, the, an exponential that contains a Boltzmann term that contains the, it's not a Boltzmann term, but an exponential that contains the quasi Fermi level splitting. And this is also called Planck's generalized law. And what this is, here's an example how it looks practically. Um, this is, this, this is an example from a cabrinium selenide solar cell. Um, this is the, the flux of, the, of, uh, of photons from the, from the absorber already divided by the E square, which comes of course from the Planck's law. And then um, at the high energy side, you get, when you plot, when, when you plot the, the, the thing logarithmically, you just get um, a linear dependence and the, the intercept way up here gives you then the quasi Fermi level splitting and the slope is one over KT. And the low energy slope, this gives you essentially the absorptance of your semiconductor film. So this is one way how to determine the quasi Fermi level splitting is you measure the spectrum, you fit um, to the high energy slope. And if it, the, the slope should be one over KT, if it is, you're fine. If it's not, you have to think about it. This could be because your film is too thin. This could be because you have a gradient. Um, this could be because you have um, a gradient in the, in the quasi Fermi level splitting. And um, there is, a somewhat safer way to determine the quasi Fermi level splitting. And for this, let's go back to the ideal Shockley Kreiser um, solar cell. And we only look at open circuit voltage for the moment. Um, in, the, in an ideal solar cell, the only thing that happens at open circuit voltage is we excite the carriers and they fall back down uh, radiatively. So we have a balance between the luminescence flux and the excitation flux, which is given by the flux from the sun and the, the surrounding black body radiation, the 300K radiation of the environment. Now, the, the, like the photoluminescence emission um, can be described with the, with the quasi Fermi level splitting. And in this ideal case, this is um, this equivalent to the open circuit voltage. And this is the Shockley Kreiser open circuit voltage where we only have radiative recombination. Now for our, for our um, detailed balance consideration for counting photons, we can easily neglect this 300 K part. It's, I think 13 orders of magnitude lower than the sun. So you cannot neglect, neglect it if you want to calculate the, the short, the JV curve, but for our considerations, it's fine to neglect it. And then now we look at the real case. In a real case, we of course have more than radiative recombination. We also have non-radiative recombination. So the, ex the, the, the carriers are excited still by the flux from the sun. And then some of them recombine radiatively, which is related to the quasi Fermi level splitting or the open circuit voltage, provided we have ideal contact. And part of it uh, recombines non radiatively, which can be translated into a non radiative flux. And um, to describe this, the amount of radiative and non-radiative recombination, we determine the external radiative efficiency, which is simply the ratio um, between the 
radiative uh, recombination and the excitation. So it's the ratio between the radiative recombination and the total recombination. And um, we can just rewrite this done as the, as the luminescence uh, flux divided by the radiative efficiency. And that equals the, the, the flux from the sun. And the flux from the sun equals to the radiative flux we would get in the ideal Schockler-Kreuzer case. And then we can just rewrite the whole thing. And um, we get the Kreuzer Fermi level splitting or open circuit voltage, provided we have ideal conduct, um, from the Schockler-Kreuzer open circuit voltage and the radiative efficiency. And the radiative efficiency is the integral part over the spectrum. So if we have a problem with the temperature at the, at the high energy slope, this may be much more easy to, to determine. So it, it's enough to measure the radiative efficiency and then you need to know the, the, the Schockler-Kreiser open circuit voltage. And then you can predict the, the, the quasi-fermi level splitting or open circuit voltage um, um, of the absorber. Um, so we need the, the Schockler-Kreiser um, uh, open circuit voltage. How do you get that? Of course, you need uh, the, the band gap of your, of your material. Let's assume you have a method to determine that. You can take um, an approximation. For sure, it works for perovskite. It's just to take the maximum of the, of the PL emission. And then you can find different tables and, and equations in the literature. Um, one that I trust is given here. But the values are actually different than you find in literature. Why are they different? So maybe you need to calculate it yourself. So to calculate the Schockler-Kreiser open circuit voltage, um, it's the ratio of the generation, the, the, all the photons coming from the sun in the gradient and over the recombination. So in Schockler-Kreiser, um, the generation is just the, the energy dependent flux from the sun and we integrate it from the band gap on. And the recombination is just given by the black body emission. And um, we integrate that also from the band gap. Um, now, this should always give the same values. It doesn't because it depends what you use for the, for the um, flux from the sun. Some people use a black body spectrum at 6,000K. Somebody use a black body spectrum at 5,800K. And some people use a tabulated AM 1.5 spectrum. And then you can take, there are also different spectra. You can take the direct spectrum or the global spectrum. And another difference, why the tabulated values are different is this factor of two down here. This factor of two comes from the fact that the solar cell has a surface and a back surface. And the black body emission can come from the surface and from the back surface. But if you put for an ideal solar cell, an ideal back reflector, there will be no emission from the back side, and then you get one here. And it's so if you find tabulated values for the Shockley Kreiser VOC. This is what you need to know. What did they use um, to calculate the, which spectrum did they use? And do they assume an ideal back reflector or not? So um, I prefer to use a AM 1.5 spectrum and a non-ideal back reflector. So I do have emission from the backside. And then you get um, a simple equation um, that you can use to calculate the Shockley Kreiser VOC. And then, so we have the Schockley-Kreiser VOC. We can determine the radiative efficiency, efficiency from quantitative photoluminescence. So you need to really count the photons, the photons in and the photons out. And um, when we have that, we can determine the, the VOC of the absorber, so the, the quasi fermi level splitting. And um, does it work? So what we've done here, that's an example for carbonium gallium selenide solar cells. Um, 
we determine the quasi Fermi level splitting from a fit to the to, to Planck's generalized law, and we determine the radiative efficiency. Um, you'll find similar graphs like that for for other for other um, um, technologies as well, and it works out. This slope here is um, has has the slope of of kT. And um, so our solar cells do lie on this line. What you see here is that the, the, the best CIGS solar cells actually lie a bit below. The, what, what is plotted here is the, is the difference. It's the loss, which is due to the non-radiative recombination. And the ideal thought that the best solar cells actually are a bit lower. And that's because I did this calculation without the ideal back reflector and these solar cells have an optimized back contact and therefore their loss is a, is a little bit lower. Um, the important thing here is, okay, two things is, th these are 23% these are, uh, uh, efficient solar cells and they have a radiative efficiency of around 1%. Um, the best gallium arsenide solar cells, they are here. They, are, they have radiative efficiencies of around 20%. So um, even in the very best solar cells, the radiative efficiency is low. It's most of the, of the um, flux does not go, of the solar flux does not go into a luminescent flux, but goes into non-radiative recombination. And then, um, for practical reasons, what to do is you can determine the quasi Fermi level splitting of your absorber either from the spectrum or from the ERE, and they are equivalent. So, the difference between the quasi Fermi level splitting and uh, ideal Shockley quasar open circuit voltage is, of course, non radiative recombination. And non radiative recombination can happen is, is Shockley retail recombination. So you have some defects at an interface in the bulk somewhere and this act as recombination centers. But you cannot only have isolated deep defects, you can also have band tails. And um, the band tails are important in some solar cell, less important in other solar cells. They seem not so much important in perovskite solar cells. Um, I do think they are important and I'll tell you why. Um, so we need to characterize them and we can again use photoluminescence to characterize them. This is um, an absorption spectrum and the absorption coefficient and um, it's plotted in inverse meters, not in inverse centimeters. So the lowest absorption values that, it, that we have here <coughs> is actually 0.1 per centimeter if you're more used to absorption coefficient uh, per centimeter. And um, the, if you want to measure absorption uh, uh, coefficient, you, you can take a photospectrometer and measure reflection and transmission. And that was the red curve here. And that's not very good because um, you get scattering if you have in particularly in thin films and then you cannot measure the low absorption values well in a photospectrometer. And there are methods developed for to measure low absorption. One is photo deflection spectroscopy, um, which goes much better and uh, almost two orders of magnitude, you can measure two orders of magnitude lower. Um, and in the low absorption coefficients, it agrees well with the PL in blue. We can also determine the absorption coefficient from PL. And when we look at Planck's generalized law, of course, there is the, the absorptance. And then if we know the thickness of our film, um, we can determine the absorption coefficient or the effective absorption coefficient. And then we get the, we, we, we can determine the absorption coefficient from PL and in the, in particularly in the region where the absorption coefficient is low, 
um, we do have a nice agreement between the photo deflection spectroscopy and the photoluminescence. And particularly when you know when you want to characterize the tail states, you want to measure um, to as low as possible absorption values, because you want to do a fit to this exponential part here. And as you see up, up here, it gets it starts to get round. So um, it's where where do you where do you put your exponential? So if you if you go um, if you get a, a wide enough range, you can get a better determination of your of 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 the um, absorption due to tail states. And what I've plotted here is um, an Urbach tail where the absorption is uh, proportional to an exponential decay, decaying with the characteristic energy, the Urbach energy. And I've never seen anything else. In all the materials I looked at, I've always only seen Urbach tail. So always an exponential decay of the tail stage into the, into the band gap. I haven't seen anything else. Up here in the round part, that's different, but deep into the gap, it's always exponential. And in perovskites, this the, the Urbach energy is rather small. It's always it's it's below 15 milli electron volts. But um, and some people argue this is below KT, it doesn't matter. But I will argue it does matter. And so before we get to that. Um, let's look what are tail states and what do they do to the to the um, to our radiative recombination. So what I've plotted here is the log of the density of states um, in an ideal semiconductor. Um, we have this square root like behavior of the density of states and in that case um, we get a maximum of the photoluminescence uh, spectrum that is it's just slightly above um, the band gap. It's KT half above the band gap. And that's because, of course, we have now in this density of state, we have our uh, the Fermi distribution um, um, of, the, of, the, of the carriers. And um, if we now determine absorption from this valence band to this conduction band, and if it's a direct semiconductor, then the absorption coefficient will depend on the square root um, of the of the energy above the band gap, and you can actually use that um, as a as a plot to determine the the band gap. If we now add this order, this order can be even in an ideal crystal. We do have this order. We do have phonons, so we do have some contribution of thermal disorder or most of our crystals are not uh, ideal. They have band gap fluctuations. They have electrostatic potential fluctuations. They can have bonding length fluctuations. Um, they can have all sorts of fluctuations and this will lead to band tails. And then there is, uh, what happens is then that the luminescence, um, the, in, in the ideal semiconductor, the, there is, um, zero density of states within the band gap. So now we do have a density of states in the band gap. And this means we do have holes and electrons here. So we do get um, luminescence from these states. And that means that the maximum of the PL actually shifts lower than this and typically around the band gap or if the tails are bad, it can even shift below the band gap. And um, the, there is a, um, where, where is my, okay, here it is. Here is the, here is the, the reference. Okay, it will come. Um, this is it's, um, a paper that um, a few years ago, um, where people started to think about um, band tails and the role of band tails in chalcopyrates in, 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 in perovskites. You have here gallium arsenide, you have here uh, crystalline silicon, amorphous silicon, CHS, which is actually um, an old um, 
uh, old CIGS solar cell, and um, I'll show you newer data, which is lower. And here is, is perovskites. And um, what you see is that there is a relationship between the VOC loss with respect to the band gap in this case and the Orbach energy of the, of the tail states. So the higher the, the Orbach energy is, the more tail states we have. The, the higher Orbach energy is, the more these tails um, extend into the band gap, the more um, open circuit loss we get. At, at the moment, this is just an empirical observation. And, um, but if you look at the slope, you get an additional loss of 200 millivolt for every 10 milli electron volts in additional Orbach energy. So it does matter. It's, um, it's 15 MeV Orbach energy do matter. And um, the, this is essentially the same plot for a, for a range of different um, carborundum gallium selenide solar cells. There is also cadmium telluride is also near the same slope. Then here the blue triangles are different. Um, perovskite solar cells in down here is single crystalline gallium arsenide. And um, so in this is, it's a, it's a much smaller range of Orbach energies, but we still get approximately the same slope. And um, so where does this loss com come from? I told you that the luminescence uh, shifts to lower energies. And this of course, has an influence on our open on our um, open circuit voltage. Um, I showed it. Um, I think it takes too long to go back. When you remember the calculation of the open circuit voltage in chocolate Kaiser, you take just a step function starting from the band gap. If you now add to that an exponential tail absorption, you get a higher recombination, you get a higher generation, but most of all, you get a much higher recombination current. And we can calculate this effect of the, of the tails on the radiative um, emission. And this is what we would expect, much less than what we see. Um, as a warning, this type of calculations is works only for tail for Orbach energy is lower than KT, but that's what we're interested in. And um, so that's not enough, but that's just the radiative loss. And we can also have a non-radiative loss. We can just have shockley retor recombination to the, through the tail states. And um, that's um, when we add that, <coughs> we still don't get enough. So um, the tail states are even worse than we would think through radiative and non-radiative recombination. And um, there could be an effect of doping, there could be non-local effects. We're still in the process of trying to understand this. The important message is this, the tail states do matter and even small tail states matter. And um, of course you can have non-radiative losses through deep defects. And that's another, um, point where photoluminescence can help us. And um, this is um, an example from carborundum selenide. It's temperature dependent uh, luminescence spectra. And at low temperatures, um, we see very nicely the, the, the band edge uh, recombination. And then we have the shallow defects here. And then we have some deep defects here. And so we do see them in, in photoluminescence. Now, if we do the same low temperature photoluminescence on a, on a, on a perovskite, we get, if you compare that here, this was the band, band luminescence or the exciton, and it's lower than the defect related luminescence. And in perovskites, we only get the, the band gap luminescence and then there is nothing. And and also down here, this is just the noise of the detector. It's nothing. There, we don't see any deep defects or shallow defects in luminescence in the perovskites. Now, in this paper here, 
There's actually, this is, there are also UPS measurements where they actually think that um, they see um, defects in UPS. So um, we don't see them optically. So there could be defects that are not optically active, which I still find amazing. And I rather still think that uh, VOC loss in the perovskites is rather due to the tail states and not due to deep defect. But um, there will be a detailed discussion tomorrow on that, I think. Um, the, there, is, there are more um, non-radiative losses and that happen at interfaces. <coughs> and and um, the, the, this is an, this is an, in, an example from, from, um, from various perovs, from perovskite with various um, contact layers. And um, here is that the colored lines are the measured quasi Fermi levels with different um, um, contact layers. And then there is the VOC. And um, the, the yellow one is actually the, the almost the, the quasi Fermi level splitting in the almost complete stack. And then the VOC in some cases is the same. And in other cases, it's considerably lower. And um, I call this the interface VOC loss. So when I have a difference between the quasi Fermi level splitting and the measured VOC in the in the in the finished solar cell, this has something to do with the interfaces with non-radiative recombination at the interface. And um, in optimized solar cells, it's it doesn't play a role in it's it's lower than 10 millivolts and that's your your measurement um, uh, uncertainty so it's how do we know that it's non-radiative recombination at or near an interface we can also do electrical analysis and can determine the, the activation energy of the recombination mechanism. And we always see that if we have a considerable difference between the Fermi level and the VOC, um, we do have a, a recombination channel with, a, with an activation energy lower than the band gap. So that always happens at the interface. For example, in this example is in here, you can have recombination between the electrons here and the holes here, and that's a, a lower activation energy. And this leads to additional recombination of the interface and due to an additional loss. And this can be caused either in this case by non-ideal band alignment. You can have at this interface a high density of defect and this could cause uh, Fermi level pinning, or you can have, if you do something wrong in the making of your solar cell, you can have a defective layer near the interface. And this defective layer will also lead to a gradient in the, in the, um, in the quasi Fermi level and will also lead um, to an effective interface recombination loss. So to summarize the VOC losses, um, the, the ultimately the VOC depends on the band gap. And from this, we can determine the shockley quasar VOC. And that would be the ideal uh, VOC that we, that we expect. Now we, do have, we can have tail states and um, tail, with tail states, we already reduce um, the radiative energy, the, the energy of the radiative recombination. And that leads to then a corresponding lower chocolate crisis type uh, VOC. And then of course we have non-radiative recombination through deep defects or, or tail states. And that leads to a quasi Fermi level splitting that's lower than we would expect for the for the if you have only radiative recombination 
And then we can have non-radiative recombination at the interface and that further decreases uh, the open circuit voltage. And so that's the open circuit voltage is the only thing we can actually use in the solar cell. And um, as Uwe pointed out, at the open circuit voltage, um, we don't get any energy out of the solar cell. Um, we need to look at the, at the maximum power point. And um, this is a, the, a simulation of um, um, a solar cell um, where we just played with the diode factor. So the, the diode ideality factor in, in Uber slides, it was always N. I, in, in my slides, it's an A. And um, the, the, the field factor depends very critically on the diode factor. And um, the, the, the inset shows um, the, the potential efficiency increase um, you can get this is based on a on the record CIGS solar cell and and you can improve by a percent in efficiency if we could reduce um, the the fill fact the diode factor from what is measured in that case it was 1.2 to to one um, so the the diode factor does play a role for the fill factor it is important. And um, we can also, so the, the, the diode factor is defined from the, from the diode equation. In solar cells, it might be better to determine it from a, from a sense VOC measurement or from, from um, JV measurements with varying intensity and um, then plotting the, 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 the short circuit current as a function of the VOC and then determine the diode factor from there. But we can also use photoluminescence to get the diode factor of the absorber itself. The diode factor depends on many things, whether you have a space charge region or not a space charge region, um, how, how good your defect, how good your contacts are and, and uh, as we've seen. And, um, but if we want to know the diode factor of the absorber, how good our uh, um, absorber is, we can use photoluminescence. And in photoluminescence, what we, what we find is an, a power law dependence between the, the flux of the, of the luminescence and the flux of the excitation. And we have this exponent K here. If we now relate this to our solar cell properties, the photoluminescence is related to the quasi Fermi level splitting and thus to the VOC of the absorber. So the VOC the absorber could provide. And the laser excitation, this is just our generation. And if we assume that we don't have big problems with transport and with, with, um, with, with collection, then we can just set this equal to our short circuit current. And if you then compare this equation here, when you, put, when, you, when you solve for this, you get the K on the other side, and then you compare this equation here with this equation, you find that the exponent is actually the diode factor. And we call this the optical diode factor. And um, this is um, also done in, in uh, just in, in perovskites. And what is plotted here is, an, is, a, is a measurement on, on a perovskite uh, solar cells with different contacts. And um, what is plotted here is the quasi Fermi level splitting. So this is already the the, the logarithm of the PL intensity as a logarithm of the excitation and we get straight lines and the exponent is between one and two. And that's the optical diode factor. And um, so what does that mean? If we have only radiative recombination, the only thing that can happen is um, excitation and radiative recombination luminescence and then the luminescence flux must be equal to the excitation flux and that gives us the k equal to one. If we have non-radiative recombination as we've seen before 
The excitation is balanced by the luminescence flux and the non-radiative flux, or the equivalent non-radiative flux. And um, I showed you the ERE before, and even in the best solar cells, this is just a few percent. So um, the, the vast majority of this um, balance here is done by non-radiative recombination. So let's look at the non-radiative recombination. The non-radiative recombination can be described by shockley reed hall recombination. And um, it's, it's done in, in every textbook on semiconductors. The shockley reed hall recombination is proportional to the delta N. It's proportional to the additional carrier concentration due to the excitation. And it's, it's proportional to delta N in high excitation and the low excitation. It always comes out proportional to delta N. And um, the, if we now consider that the, the, the luminescent um, recombination can be almost neglected, um, the delta N is proportional to the excitation. And if we now look at the luminescence, which is given by the concentration of electrons and holes, if we have low excitation, we will change only the minority carriers and the, the majority carriers will be constant. And then the luminescence intensity will be proportional to delta N. In high excitation, we do change both and then the luminescence flux will be proportional to delta N squared. Now, delta N is for the is for the non rate delta N is proportional to the excitation. So in the low excitation case, we get a K equals one. And in the high excitation case, we get a K equals two. And um, in this is this is simply because uh, the, the, another way to look at it is um, how many how many quasi Fermi levels do shift, and um, here is a simulation for a semiconductor with different doping densities, and it's we take a, we start with a p-type semiconductor, and this is it's this should be the generation flux here, um, so at low excitation the Majority quasi Fermi level does not shift, and the minority uh, quasi Fermi level does shift. And <clears throat> as we increase the excitation, also the, min the majority quasi Fermi level does shift. And this, what is high excitation, of course, depends on the doping level. So for low doping, we need a, a higher, we, we are already in high excitation at low generation fluxes and for high doping, we need a very high um, generation flux to get into high excitation. And so we get a K equals one, we're in low excitation, where only one quasi Fermi level shifts, and we get a K equals two in high excitation, where both Fermi levels shift. Now, perovskites are low doped, so they're always in high excitation. So, in perovskites, we would expect a K equals two. And some people have argued that because we don't get K equals two, um, we, we are actually very close to non-radiative recombination and we're in the transition to K equals one. But then you would not get a straight line. Then you would get a transition from K to two equals two to K equals one. So it's not um, uh, radiative recombination. It's actually the interface again. And um, this is... Um, I adopted the, this this uh, graph from 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 this paper. They got the model right, but they're, they're, they didn't plot the graph right. So this is a good interface, and this is a, a interface with a bad band alignment where you do have interface recombination. And um, if we so now we excite 
So we shift both. Hi, in Susanna, sorry to interrupt you. I think uh, in order to make time for the discussion, um, I have I, to- I should, I should stop. So, so um, the, the key is in, in, if you have a good interface, both Fermi levels shift. And if you have a bad interface, one of the Fermi levels shifts only a little, and that gives you a K smaller one. And so it's not radiative recombination that makes you the case smaller one, it's the recombination at the interface. And then this also gives you low, it gives you a higher, it gives you a lower um, diode factor, which is what you would like, but it gives you a lower um, uh, quasi Fermi level splitting. So it's not good to have this. And with this, I finish and I just put my conclusions up. Um, I hope I convinced you that um, PL is a useful tool.